so this week we talked about iterative search and there were two specific versions of that. One was the Tune Bayes, and that was using Bayesian optimization. And it gets a little deep with the math uh, for anybody that wants to go deep. Um, they talked about the Gaussian process model and the acquisition function, um, the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, and then went through a couple of examples. So I have kind of a, a combination of things here that I ended up doing. And yeah, this is, I um, basically went through the materials for the class and just, you know, rendered it on my uh, own version of our studio. And we kind of just walked through what they did and then what the um, previous cohorts had done. So as always, we want to have some kind of model um, in the book, they're using cell data, and for the class, they use the Palmer Penguins data. Uh, Palmer Penguins is pretty neat because it's kind of the um, new version of the old iris data without the yucky eugenics <laughs> tie-in. Uh, so it's, it's good for, for these kinds of classification problems. So in this case, they're saying, try to predict the sex of the penguin from all these various other features. Um, and in terms of the data itself, uh, as you see, if you look at the missing data, uh, some of the sex are missing, so they filter that out. And then the island in the year, clearly that has absolutely nothing to do with the gender of the penguins, so they take that out. Uh, from there, we do the usual things, the initial split based on our outcome variable, and we're looking at it five uh, fold cross-validation, and we're going to use the area under the curve as our objective. Um, using the SVM, and then the two parameters to uh, look at there are the cost and RBF sigma. So we specify that that's what we're going to do. We're going to tune on these two. We're doing classification. Kern Lab just tells us what engine to use. Um, and then here's something where, you know, it shows how you can look at specifics of your parameters. So if you say cost, it gives you the range, which, you know, I wondered about that. So that's nice to know. It tells you, you know, it, it can go from negative 10 to 5 is your typical range. And then it, it tells you what kind of transformation is involved. So in this case, log base 2. Um, and then for the RBF, it's a log base 10 on the... Um, the variable. So with the iterative uh, methods, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could just do the iteration. So you just choose a point, improve, choose another point, improve, just keep going. Um, the way they did it in the book and in the class is they started with a two by two grid. And you see what you end up getting. Um, cost, here's the boundaries, negative six to one negative six to negative four. And you then get, yeah, these combinations. So this cost, this sigma, this cost, this sigma, and then these. So as they say, when you do that, you see one point that's definitely better than the others. And then kind of as a spoiler, if you look in the book, they did go through the exercise of saying, what does that in fact look like? And if you were to go through a very exhaustive uh, computational exercise of, of figuring out where you would get the best results, it, it looks something like this. So you see, even if you did a grid, if you did a grid over here, it's, it's not going to help you at all <laughs> because it's basically just, you know, poor results here. And then, and then, you know, you have this ridge where you have the much better results. So again, that gets back to that point that with an iterative method, you can be more directed so you're basically as you go learning you know which direction do i need to go to get that better result versus a kind of you know for lack of a better word brute force approach where you just kind of scan the space Steve, so if you, yeah if you don't mind me asking a question in that comment this uh, image of rock auc service yeah would it imply that 
the optimal fit that you have currently, if we were to go to the top right of this mm -hmm. quadrant, it would imply almost overfitting then? Um, or, or you start to get uh, too much noise or uh, uh, erroneous results. Uh, your, your prediction is not uh, what it should be. You're taking in too much. The, the overfitting com, uh, concept I'm thinking in my brain is uh, your, your, your paths, uh, not paths, the, the, the line that is drawn is uh, too uh, specific uh, to specific. all of the data points instead of being more linear. I, I believe that you're probably protected from that somewhat by the fact that you're doing the cross validation. So as you're doing this, you are evaluating that area under the curve on the part of the set that you didn't use to train. So I, th I, I think that kind of protects you. I, I feel like if you go really deep, some people will argue that, you know, there, there still is a risk i guess there's always a risk so so this is just a way to kind of protect yourself from it i think is kind of how my understanding of it would be yeah so that's a good uh, uh comment though um and and yeah just something that we always should be mindful of um so okay so again we saw the first grid and we saw that there's one that's better and then again this is different data this is that cell data so you see in this case, less of a difference. So that's kind of a nice thing that, you know, previous cohorts have, have tried this on different data where you see a pretty dramatic difference in this case. So that, that was interesting that they did that. Um, Bayesian optimization. Okay, so, so this was interesting. Um, everybody loves Bayesian techniques. So that's, you know, you get the Bayes uh, buzzword. Uh, <laughs> but we kind of try to understand what, what it is we got exactly doing. So, yeah, so it talks about what they're doing. So create the model based on previously generated results. So they resample new parameters and then create a model that recommends additional tuning parameter values based on resampling results of the previous step. Um, so then you, you have some, um, you know, as always, knobs. So you could tell how many iterations you want it to do, or you could tell until there's no improvement in the results. So kind of a funny thing with this one, one of my coworkers used this and he kind of set this very high and it ran for a whole week. <laughs> so be careful <laughs> when you set these things. Um, I, I think he kind of overdid it. Um, you know, you, you can set, and, and again, you just kind of look at what other people have done and just kind of use a little bit of judgment. And yeah, if you if you set things too high, it's just going to run forever. OK, so. This one, OK, so so they did talk about what the underlying model is. Um, and I guess I just kind of put it out there. Did you all get a chance to read it? What was kind of your feeling about the Gaussian process model? if you had a chance to read it. In my past experience, what I, I have a vision in my, my head that I, I put together for mm -hmm. this entire learning concept. And I've always thought about a sine wave and then as it, as it starts to uh, lose amplitude and, and finally get to zero where now you've got the best prediction, right? Or, or it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's gotten perfect. I've rethought that same image in my head. Have you ever watched the videos where you test a steel anvil uh, for its hardness and you drop a, a steel ball bearing on it and it'll bounce? Well, you're never mm -hmm. going to reach the, the highest peak, right? This is like physics when you, when you lose that energy and it bounces back off the steel. Mm -hmm. If you've got a really good anvil, uh, it will maximize the return. So you're never going to reach the point of, of entry, but it's going to get as close to that as possible. If you've got a bad anvil, it's just going to drop dead, right? It, it, the, uh, yeah. the steel ball bearing will just fall flat. My thought process in this gauging, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, in this process, this learning process, is that as that ball is bouncing, it's going to continually run, 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 run until it finally comes to a flat point. Now, mm -hmm. this could take for quite some time the comment about your coworker and, and you know processing it for an entire week. If you were to wait until that finally comes to a, a zero rest point, that's going to be your perfect model. Mm -hmm. The 
measurement or the expectation that we're looking for is how much of a return that steel ball bearing bounces back off the anvil. And I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. Um, it could be completely incorrect. Uh, it just helps me comprehend the computing uh, computing process or the algorithm that we're applying this mm -hmm. testing uh, uh, and how it it starts to get closer and closer and closer to that perfect uh, point or mm -hmm. expected point. Kind of converges, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's good. I, I had not heard that analogy, but that that is good, I think, to, yeah, to that, have that, that makes sense. Yeah. a mental picture, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I'm probably going to butcher if I go through this, but I'm going to make my best effort because I feel like there's kind of deeper math here. Um, and, and I do kind of have it as a follow up action for me. Uh, to read at least, yeah, so so they reference this uh, blog post, it's actually an interactive blog post um, that kind of goes into more of the math, uh, deep math. Um, so they're saying the elegant properties are it computes new performance statistics because we obtain a full probability model. So again, that's the Bayesian thing, you're thinking about the, the probability model, and then as you get more data, you know, you're adjusting your probability model and your understanding. Um, and representing the highly nonlinear, yeah, you know, so anytime you can get a handle on nonlinear relationships, that's uh, pretty good. You're dealing with some pretty good tools then. Um, yeah, well, it's a powerful technique. It can be complex to set up. So you think about how to set it up, how to pick the parameters and resources. Um, so they do have a picture here that I felt was helpful again, just kind of in terms of getting the mental picture, because they talk about as you do these calculations, so, so when you're you know, doing your training, you have these points. And so at these points, you don't have the variance, so you don't have these uh, gray areas above and below, because you know exactly you know, what they are and, and, and what the mean is. Um, and then you have a picture of what the rest of your space looks like. So for things that are close together, these little, confidence intervals are tighter because you know we we kind of have more information i guess is a way to look at it and then as you get things that are you know further separated then you see situation where you know there's a lot of uncertainty um so then they talk about the exploration versus exploitation which i've heard used in other contexts too uh so exploitation is you know grabbing a hold of a game that you already have, and then exploration is maybe taking more of a risk for a possible great reward. So the example they have here is if you wanted to do exploitation, you know, we have this curve and we'd say, what's the highest point on the curve? So that would be an exploitation. Exploration is kind of illustrated here because we see there's a lot of uncertainty. So we could get a much better result potentially um, but also much worse. So that's the exploration. And then if you were to choose that approach, you'd go here. And then obviously there's like some heavy duty math behind it again. That's why I gave myself homework <laughs> to do some more reading. Um, but I felt like I felt like um, Max and Julia did a pretty good job here, just sort of illustrating it in, in a visual way. So so that was, uh, does that does that kind of make sense to everybody else too? Sort of how they explain? Yeah, cool. Um, and then they also talk about, yeah, and here they're shooting for uh, R squared. So again, there's, you know, very tight boundary here, but then here it's um, much more uh, spread out and uh, fat tails. <laughs> yeah, so you could get a, a much better result. Um, so again, there's, there's some heavy duty math going on. Um, but we can put that to work for us with this tune base function. And the way they set it up here is we've got our folds, we've got our metrics that we're shooting for, and the SVM pram has our, our new. Um, they decide on 25 iterations and they're doing verbose, which is nice. So you can see what it's doing. And as a result of that process, uh, for their cell data, they get this, they get a 975. And then let's take a quick look at what it was. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is what they did for the penguins. And then if you go to the Max and Julia, 
Yeah. Oh, and okay. Yeah. So they also explain the um, acquisition functions, which again, that's um, if you want to get a little bit more inside baseball. So for the cell data, and then it shows kind of what it looks like. You know, it'll tell you what your current best is. And, and you get this nice little heart <laughs> if you get the best one. So that's very encouraging. Um, and, and then like you, if you get one that's not necessarily great, it will give you the little X. Um, so, so you could look at the best. So, it, so in this case, a little lower, that's like 899. Um, and then you, there's also the auto plot. So this shows you sort of how it progressed over time. And this is kind of an interesting one because yeah, you see how it kind of walks all around a little bit, but then you see your best one is is kind of earlier in the process. But just by you know doing all those iterations, you know you know that you've explored more of the space. Now again, if you're a visual person, they end up doing a video. I don't know if I can speed up this video or not. Let's see, playback speed. No. But yeah, it, it just kind of shows. Um, so so you see the mean and then the standard deviation. So so obviously we're shooting for a high mean and, and the standard deviation tells you where you might have opportunities you can leverage. And just over time, the coloring changes as we get more and more certain. Yeah, and you can see, yeah, it, it, um, as you get further on, it's pretty much landed on this as being the best place for you to be parameter wise oh so, something i kind of wondered i don't know about you guys but whenever it ends up on the boundary of the box i always wonder should i go further <laughs> you know because i don't know if there's a rule for that but yeah if there's like rules of thumb so let's see so if the search is seeded with initial grid space filling design would be better choice samples more unique values and would improve the predictions um, Let's see. So any any other comments on the Bayesian stuff? I feel like it was, like I said, I, I feel like the math is something that I would like to go d dive a little deeper into, but I feel like I have at least enough understanding of, of how to do it that, yeah, I could, could put it to work, so. Now, the next one they did is simulated annealing. And this was cool because I actually remember this from grad school because I did, I don't know if I mentioned, but when I was in grad school, this is like long ago, um, I was doing some stuff with neural networks. And I remember my professor talking about different methods for optimizing. And he said, you know, simulated annealing, it's like, you know, the process of annealing for metal. And again, if you want to kind of explore what that means, Yeah, I remember this from grad school. So, um, so annealing dates back hundreds of years. But but the basic idea is when you heat up the metal, and I think I had a nice image of it, but I lost it. But um, metal will get very brittle. But a way to deal with that is if you heat it up, it uh, will, you know, cause the atoms. It frees up the atoms so they can move around more. And and the hotter you know it is, the more they can move. Um, so that enables them to kind of find a, a, a better state to be in <laughs> so that there's less brittleness. Um, and it's similar to what we're trying to do because we basically want to, again, we're exploring a space. So as we start exploring the space, you know, there might be a lot of hills and valleys. So we want it to be very hot. And then that gives it a lot of energy where it can kind of go anywhere at once. Uh, you don't get stuck so like if you have something where okay now I, I <laughs> if you have like a shallow and a very deep one and it's like very low energy it will stay in that shallow one but if you have a higher energy it can can find the the deeper one so so intuitively hopefully that uh, kind of helps understand what it is um any other thoughts on that did did that kind of make sense or do you feel like that's a good explanation um so yeah so like i said i I like things that make sense um, <laughs> that are based on uh, physics. Uh, always good to know. Um, so, so again, there's, there's, you know, you can go as deep into this as you want. As they talk about, you know, 
why would you accept a result versus um, reject it and keep exploring? And so there's a probability based on, you know, the percent difference between old and new values. So, so how much better is it? And the I, so if you, if you have like a negative exponent, the I is the iteration. So the probability just gets lower and lower over time that you're going to accept the new result. Um, and, and then they talk about the acceptance probability. So, you know, if you set it, if you set the coefficient low, it means you are more likely to accept versus if you set it higher, what I'm understanding is you're rejecting, yeah, you're rejecting things a lot sooner. So, so here you see the green kind of extends out several iterations. Here it's kind of like, eh, it's getting rejected pretty quick. And then there's this curve like this. So let's see. Oh yeah, it can be helpful to start a say restart threshold. So this is kind of a fail safe where if you have several failures, it just says, well, let's go back to our, our best parameter and, and start over. Um, oh, here you go. That's my uh, image. Uh, so, so you see it's very hot, pliable. It recrystallizes, and then there's something called grain restructuring. And I'm not a metallurgist, so I don't fully understand what grain restructuring is. But yeah, that's what that is. And I did find some good videos, honestly, that also explain this. And I can share them in the chat. Oh yeah, so one that was fun was uh, simulated in annealing explained by solving Sudoku. <laughs> so if you're data is everywhere, and then we got our, our little ad. Do you but, think it is? Yeah, I don't know. That I should watch the whole thing, but yeah, he, he taught. Yeah, so I felt like this was a pretty good video. So I'll go ahead and drop that in the chat real quick, and I also added it to the uh, document, and I may either just share the document or you know maybe merge it in with everything else let's see sorry i need to find where the chat is you know what i'll just send, i'll just put these in the chat say, drop down from your top menu with the presenter all of your controls go to the very oh top. yeah yeah oh i see uh, um, if you can pop that open yeah i'm not the master of zoom master of zoom so one one is about sudoku and then the other one was kind of funny because it kind of like almost a um it was from Udacity and it was almost like a talk show thing where these two guys are like, well, what does that mean? Oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> you know, so it was very conversational and, and I thought intuitive. So there's the Zoom chat. Um, so, so if you run that and then I, I ran it, you know, again in our studio. So this is the simulated annealing part. And one thing to note, I noticed, so for Bayesian, they did 25 iterations. Uh, for the simulated annealing, they did 50. Um, and you see, again, if you have the uh, verbose, it gives you, personally, I always choose verbose. I don't know about you guys, but I just like seeing how things are going. <laughs> um, so it, it shows you sort of the process. So you, so you get some improvements, suboptimals, you accept, you discard. Oh, and so right here, it did that thing that we talked about where, okay, see up here, we're like 8595. And then we get down to like a seven four. So at that point, it says, "Up, oh, start over." And then at the end of the process, fifty iterations. And then I did another thing that that was interesting to me. I, I said, "How long does it take comparatively?" Um, and the results there. Okay, and you see, like they have this very nice uh, picture of annealing and metallurgy. This is from the uh, previous cohort. And then there was also this uh, a good visualization that kind of talked about how it explores the space. So I was wondering, so, so again, we talk about, and I don't know how much people have thought about it or kind of what, you, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts. So this book is great because it tells you all these different techniques, but then I always wonder if I am faced with a new problem, why, why would I choose one versus another, you know? Um, so 
I guess there's a lot of criteria. One would be, you know, hopefully you understand it pretty well. So, so you would use that um, and, and, you know, make an argument for, you know, why it's a good thing to use. Um, obviously, you'd be uh, interested in, you know, the accuracy. So, so I just said, you know, why don't we just compare the two here? So we end up getting the same accuracy either way. So it's like either one is pretty good. Um, I mentioned we use different number of iterations. And then I just did like a system time thing to see, you know, how long that would be. And this is just, you know, again, this is on my MacBook, so it's not super scientific. Um, if you did Bayes, it took about 104 seconds. If you did simulated annealing, it took 86. So it seems like, you know, perhaps Bayes is, is slower and more compute intensive. I, I don't know that it's a, you know, conclusively so. So, but I, I just wanted to, to look at that as, you know, you know, more data points, I guess, just to, to help us make decisions. Um, personally, I, I, I kind of find the whole simulated annealing thing pretty interesting. And, and like I said, I, I feel like it's, you know, maybe it's, it's also perhaps easier to explain than the Bayes approach. So, so that might be something to think about if you, if you had to explain it to somebody and they were asking you, um, you choose something where you feel like it would be, you know, easier to, to get them to understand and, and buy into what you're doing. So we've got, um, you know, the blog post from Julia that they uh, reference here. And we have, um, like I said, for me, I'm gonna go take a deeper dive into the Gaussian processes. And then we have videos, past videos. And then, yeah, my little addition was, like I said, I have solving Sudoku and then I have the one properties of, of simulated annealing. So those are, those are two good videos I'd recommend having a look at. So let's see, and then we have cohort two, three, and then we're cohort four, right? I think, I don't know why we're in there. <laughs> yes, it's cohort four. Okay, yeah, so I guess we'll be here soon, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so what, so any kind of thoughts? I mean, yeah, I guess I crammed that into 30 minutes, which is pretty fast, but uh, hopefully that was uh, beneficial. Steve, I like your comment of choosing the right uh, uh, process algorithm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, being able to, to figure out, given the data that you're collecting or, or, or provided, choosing the right process and then interpreting that particular process. The earlier comment you said going the Bayesian uh, process versus the annealing, you received an optimized you know twenty seconds of processing time faster. What what makes me think in the back of my mind in that regard would be the whole concept of the whole XG boost and all the topics surrounding that. The uh, more optimized manner of you know automating the selection, letting the mm -hmm. computer run its own process, and then spitting out. Uh, you know what what its expect what its optimal value would be given that algorithm. The um, I, I I appreciate and I I'm very much uh, supportive of your statement of going and reading more about some of these subjects. The idea that I've I've tried to in this cohort and other cohorts is expand into a topic that I'm unfamiliar with and then mm -hmm. challenge myself to comprehend what exactly that implies. Um, if we go too far, and then that's where I start to get into the ISLR and the rethinking R and, and mm. those book clubs, it may be too foreign. I enjoy the balance that we're receiving here or your presentation in respect oh. to the annealing process. Your, your explanation is perfect. Right. Um, that's all. That, I was just going to throw that in there, add that in there. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you had to say two two differences two differences between uh, Bayesian and the simulated annealing, mm -hmm. what they would be? Oh, two differences. Yeah. Hmm. Well, <laughs> let's see. What would be a good way to explain that? Well, yeah, I would say that the Bayesian is very, very, 
kind of mathematically motivated, whereas the like I said, the simulated annealing is uh, more, you know, we're trying to learn something from the physical world. So it's like the Bayesian one, we're kind of approaching it from strictly a mental model kind of way. Whereas the simulated annealing, I feel like we're saying, what, what do we know about the world and, and how is that helpful to us? Um, although kind of an interesting thing about Bayesian methods is, and, and you know, not to get too deep, um, a lot of the sampling, uh, you know, algorithms they use in Bayesian methods are motivated by physics. So, so increasingly there's kind of this interesting convergence where, um, you know, in this field you have the, the very theoretical uh, mathematical side, but then you also have the other angle that people look at, you know, what's happening in the physical world and, and, and you know, how can I use that? And, you know, equations about how things behave uh to to help you know get better results so i guess that would be one difference um the other difference let's take a look at them real quick so let's look at how you would set them up um so so we basically in both cases we have our grid so we start with our grid and then we set up i think i think another difference would be probably you know, how do you set up the problem? So that's kind of where I'm going with that. So what all, yeah, what all can you, what all knobs can you fiddle? So, so right here, <coughs> mostly uh, the only one that we're really looking at is the iteration. So obviously you could go a lot further if you wanted to. Let's look at actually the help that will help us. And that might be, something you use when you make a choice. So what all can we set? Oh, so so you can so we talked about the acquisition function, right? So so if you're using Bayes versus the other, you might have to, you know, think about the acquisition function. However, um, you know, the default is is very good. <laughs> so, so you'd probably be fine um, using the default. Um, let's see, for the other one, Simulated annealing. I feel like simulated annealing maybe has more knobs to do. Um, oh yeah, so um, sorry if I interrupt you. You did add some uh, digits. Um, what, uh, just just before what you were searching on the help page uh, here in the R markdown. So you yeah. add some digits just to to tell you that. You, you don't, don't save it like that because otherwise you have some digits here in your uh, R markdown. If you go, uh, you, if you scroll up. Scroll up, yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Where is it? Like here? So here's Tune Bays. Yeah, Tune Bays is right here. Okay. I feel like I, I shouldn't have done that. I feel like I, act, oh, here you go. Maximum number uh -huh. of pages. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I accidentally deleted that. That's yeah, you just good. don't save it. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Dangers of doing things live. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess the big thing would be, yeah, the, the difference would be in the ways that you can optimize them. So yeah, you can, so for Bayes, you know, potentially you you use a different objective function. You you definitely would use you know different iterations depending on what you feel is best. Uh, we talked about the stopping condition, right? So you might not want your thing to run all week, <laughs> so you would change you would change that. Let's see, simulated simoneal. Take a quick look at that. So I feel like there's more to this that is missing. So with simulated annealing, yeah, the other settings that you have are having to do with the cooling schedule. So yeah, how how likely are you to reject things? And then, you know, do you, you know, when do you give up? Like like we gave up right here. So so yeah, so I guess I guess the differences have to do with um with all of these things is, is what kind of decisions you can make about how you set it up before you, you run it. 
Yeah. And then behind the scenes, yeah, obviously there's kind of a different theory that's backing it up. I hope that helps somewhat. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's my thoughts on that. Yeah. So that's iterative search. So let's see what's coming up next. Let's have a quick preview of next week. Oh, do we have anybody uh, scheduled for next week? I guess that was one question. Uh, I guess not yet. Oh, this is a fun one too, screening many models. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. That, that, the, the, this is the chapter I started with in the previous yeah. report. So I did it. So I did, maybe that would be nice for someone else to do that. Um, yeah. Maybe, uh, I don't know, otherwise we can uh, share the chapter. Mm -hmm. For example, say uh, I do the second part, you do the first part or something like that. So we can yeah, that, that would be cool. Um, three, three parts or whatever it is. And so we can have a more uh, a discussion at least. Yeah, the, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I'd be open to that if, if you wanted to split or if somebody wants to go for it and take it all, that's fine also. Yes, uh, this chapter is uh, as well, uh, it's, not, it's not that interesting as iterative search because I think that that, that chapter is even, it has been a little challenging, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I would say, yeah, I would call it challenging, certainly. Um, you know, if you come at it from how do I do it? Yeah, yeah, you just kind of can potentially grab the code and go. But yeah, I always want to uh, understand a little better what's going on behind the scenes. So I feel like, yeah. but, but I feel like they gave us a good roadmap in, in, in like a starting point here. Right. So, yeah. uh, so the, this, uh, this bit here with the probabilities is the most, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you see when, when it would be uh for you to apply the Bayesian or not but uh, the uh the screening many models is like reassuming all we did it uh mm -hmm. since the beginning of uh since the start so the, the first chapters uh going through the this um, chapter 15 so they do mm -hmm. all the models in in uh, using the workflow set and uh, then run like some uh, linear, nonlinear models uh, all together uh, and then select the best one. That, that, that's interesting. It takes a bit of time for, for you to, to be able to run the, the things because then there is the racing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's a very good chapter because it summarizes everything uh making comparison between things so it's it's quite straightforward somehow i can say so it's not nothing mm -hmm. um but it just takes time if you want to see in your r um run uh, the the of the models and everything it might take like two mm -hmm. or three hours or something. It depends by your course and- in, in uh, Yeah, what kind of- yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must use the parallel and everything. Uh, yeah, that- it's good, yeah. Yeah, that was something I, I leveraged when I was doing my little assignment, the parallelism, and then, yeah, I actually used the, the racing method. So I was able to try a lot of things more quickly than I would have been otherwise. So that's good. And then, yeah, and then this is, I think a good one because again, it's like, let's compare them let's you know see which is better sort of thing it's it's a good uh, thing to do predicted observe yeah so it's pretty okay. nice nothing yeah. too terrible <laughs> yeah so so we can do that um yeah so that's kind of all i really had prepared <laughs> so yeah that, that's very good thank you thank you very much thank you um, I don't know if you, Ryan, uh, like to uh, try that as, uh, somehow. Maybe to see. Let me try and run the. Let me try and run the code in chapter fifteen. I. I so going back to the very beginning comment, uh, where the quest of this book club for me particularly is mm -hmm. comprehension of the various models and and 
how to apply them given the data set that you're working with. So mm -hmm. Steve, your interview, I, I don't think I would do very well given my naive approach to actually solving the initial, which selection do I go with? Um, I think, let me try to run the code in chapter 15 and mm -hmm. get a good interpretation or a, a good intrinsic understanding of exactly what these different selection points are doing. Um, I'll, if it's okay, I can report back uh, over the weekend on Slack to you, Frederica, and, and see, um, given sure. a presentation on this media, uh, would sure. that help at all? Yeah, yes, of course. That that would be that that that, that would be useful. And uh, I would just add that uh, um, you you'll find uh, um, like different kind of models, and uh, uh, just for you to see that you can use them all, uh, and then see the deep, what's happened when it discards them because at the end you choose just the the best one and um, the, the 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 second part that that's why i said maybe we like to to share the because the second part where there's the racing thing um that that would be interesting as well to to go through and understand because there's two um uh, uh, there's two two types to choose from, uh, and um, uh, you can see running run when when you run the the, the function what happens. Uh, so it might take some time, but that would be useful to have a discussion. In Yeah, I'm happy to um, if if we do decide to split it or whatever, just let me know if there's any kind of yeah wish to do that. Um, yeah, otherwise, like I said, uh, Brian, if you want to do it, that that's cool too. I love that. So yeah. Oh, I'm not hearing uh, Federica. Are you there? <laughs> oh no. Uh, sorry, uh, just oh, no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. muted. I uh, was looking at the chapter because I, I thought I was said something that wasn't uh, um, like the uh, co correct thing. Mm. But, uh, you know, you can see best results, finalizing models. Uh, and then, um, yeah, maybe uh that there's more things on the following chapters as well mm -hmm. uh and they 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 even add more things on the book on this final version of the book uh so there were some uh, few things that weren't on on the previous course when i follow it the the book club so we might find a few more uh, graphics and everything Okay. All right. Well, I'm jealous of uh, your uh, setting there. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great weekend. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Th thank you very much. See you next week. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye.